be seated. When you pray for others, I don't think there's a greater privilege that Christians have than praying. I don't know how you feel about prayer today, but let me, let me just remind you that when we pray, we are coming into the presence of God. This is not just merely a routine or a ritual that we go through, but when we pray, when we talk to God, we are coming into the very presence of God. What an awesome privilege that God lets us talk to Him, that God lets us come to His throne of grace and lay there our souls bare, and God uh, can hear our prayers. But it is also a privilege to be able to pray for other Christians. Now, if you're a parent, especially if you have teenagers, I know you're praying for your kids. But I got news for you as an old man, you pray for your kids whether they're teenagers or not. You never get over that. And so pray for them. But what, have you ever wondered how to pray? What should I pray? What is the most pressing issues about which we should be praying? I want to show you from our text today that there are three things about prayer that we need to learn. First of all, we need to pray with a servant's heart. In other words, what I'm saying to you this morning, dear friend, is we don't come to the throne of God in arrogance and in pride. and We don't come to the throne of God making our demands of God. That is not what prayer is. Prayer is not informing God. Prayer is not making demands of God. Prayer is coming to God as a servant. Let me show you how Paul identified himself in verse 1. He said, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. Now if you've read any of the Pauline epistles at all, you immediately know, notice something that is a little different. Throughout the Pauline epistles, Paul would identify himself and his associate, and then he would say, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. He had every right to say that. He was indeed an apostle, but he doesn't say that to the Philippians. He doesn't say, Paul and Timothy and I am a, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Slavery was rampant in Philippi, which was an outpost of the Roman Empire. And there were slaves everywhere. In fact, it has been said that there were more slaves in the Roman Empire than there were freed men. And there were all of these negative connotations about slavery as there is in our day. But Paul doesn't say that he is a slave of Pilate. He doesn't say that he is a slave of, uh, of, a, of a country or of a government. He says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. That changes everything. We are a slave of Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me say this. If you have been saved by the grace of God, the greatest life you will ever live is the life of a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, when, when we, we, we plot, we plan, we have our calendars, we have our phones, but at the end of the day, as a slave of Jesus Christ, we get up every morning reporting for duty and we receive the directions of the day from our King. We're just servants. Implied in this word also is that we don't have any rights. We don't have the right to say, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. No, 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 no. As slaves, as slaves, we don't get our direction from ourselves. We get our direction from our king. Amen. Come on. Now, here's the necessary attitude. For you to be a servant of the Lord Jesus, here's the necessary attitude. Humility. A slave of Jesus Christ. Do you know why many of our prayers are not answered? I'm convinced. Because we come into, God, into God's presence with this attitude that God owes me or that I deserve and friend, I want to tell you an attitude of humility will never lead you to the conclusion that you deserve anything from God. The fact of the matter is we don't deserve anything. 
We don't deserve the salvation that God has given us. We don't deserve access into the presence of God. We don't deserve for God to hear our prayers. We don't deserve for God to act on our behalf. It is all by the grace of God. And by the way, you say, well, I'm not sure I want to have a humble heart. And and I'm not sure what that would look like. In chapter 2, Paul says that it was Christ who was made in the form of a servant, a slave. Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, became a servant in order that we might have salvation. When you pray, pray with a humble heart. Secondly, when you pray, pray with a heart of thanksgiving. You'll notice in verse 3 that that Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every prayer ought to include an element of thanksgiving. Every prayer should include an element of thanksgiving. You see, this is not, we're not talking about a national holiday. We're talking about a way of life for every believer that, that gratitude fills our heart, that thanksgiving is a part of our life. We, we live as a grateful people acknowledging that God's grace and God's goodness is operative in our lives. And we offer up daily, many times a day, a prayer of thanksgiving to God. I thank my God, but now watch this. And I know you already know this, but let me point it out to you. Paul said, I thank Thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul does not here give thanks for things. Paul gives thanks for people. Did you notice that? I thank God for you. That's right. It's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's biblical to give thanks for the blessings of God, for His provisions, for food, for health. All of that is fine, and we ought to be thankful for all of that. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you gave thanks to God for a person? As a matter of fact, let's just take a moment and think about that a little more deeply. Your prayer life this morning. Did you utter a word of thanksgiving to God for somebody in your life? Here's what I envision. Here's what I envision in my heart this morning. That there's a family gathered around the the dinner table and, and the dad leads the family in prayer and giving thanks to God for the food that is prepared. And in his prayer, he offers up a prayer of thanksgiving and he thanks the God of heaven that God has given him these beautiful, healthy children. And he thanks God for a for a supportive wife. And I I can see those children thinking in their heart, my dad thanks God for me. I can see that wife saying, he thanks God for me. Do your children know by chance today that you are thankful to God for them? Now in this context, Paul is talking about a church. And and by the way, we ought to be thankful for churches. I've just finished a revival at the church that baptized me. And I told them I'd always love them. (laughs) You're talking about showing a lot of grace. Now, they showed a lot of grace when I was a kid. How can you not be thankful for that? And some other things I'm not so thankful for about them, but uh, they showed grace. They baptized me. I'm thankful for that. And Paul says, "This this is what I'm thankful for. I'm not thankful for your building and your budgets. I'm thankful for your people. Be thankful for people. And here's the reason why. You notice that in verse 5, as he thinks about this church that had ministered to his needs time and again, as he thinks about this church on their knees in prayer for him, as he's canvassing the Roman Empire, preaching the gospel of the Lord, he said, I thank God every time I think about you, I thank God for you. And here's why. For your fellowship, in the gospel. When Paul says, I thank God for your fellowship in the gospel. Now stop and think about that. Your participation, your joint participation in the gospel. And Paul said, here's a church that has, has supported me financially. They have prayed for me. They have helped me. They have encouraged me. And Paul said, in doing all of that, you have participated with me in the gospel. Let me tell you something. The gospel, winning people to Christ, is never a one-man show. Amen. Here's what I mean. 
Paul is able to go out across the Roman Empire and preach the gospel. But there is the Philippian church on their knees praying that God would bless him. God would help him. There's the Philippian church extending an offering to him so that he might go on to the regions beyond and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the the church when Paul would come by. He would encourage them and, and the church would encourage him and say, Paul, just keep on preaching. Paul, go the extra mile. Go on and preach the gospel of the Lord and Paul said when you're through your prayers through your offering through your encouragement you are participating in the gospel of the Lord Jesus we do that at our church did you know that? we're participating in the gospel of Jesus Christ that's being preached in Spain you take Daniel Estrada uh, from Mexico City and he's in Spain preaching the gospel. He's not over there by himself. You say, what's his family with him? Yeah, but that's not what I mean. What I mean, a part of us is over there with him. Every time you pray this week for the Estrada family, guess what's happening? You are participating in the fellowshipping, in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you lift him up to God in prayer and he's out there preaching and he's out there witnessing and somebody gets on their face before God and calls upon the name that is above every name and they are saved. We have fellowship in the gospel. Think about it. Think about it. Think about how unlimited the possibilities are. We, 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 we can reach our community. We can reach our families. We can reach our city. But how can we ever reach the regions beyond? We can do it through financial offerings. We can do it through praying for these men whom God has sent to the regions beyond. And every time, listen to me, every time somebody is saved through the preaching of the gospel, we have participated in that person's salvation. Praise the Lord. Do you see how big a deal it is to fellowship in the gospel? Paul said, when I think about how deeply You have fellowship with me. Gratitude fills my heart. And I have to lift my voice to God. Thanking God for you. I uh, am sure there are people all of us here today should be thanking God for. Let me tell you a story where I was this last week. That's the church where I was saved. And I said they baptized me. There was a big group of little boys in that church. And behind the pulpit was a classroom on either side with accordion doors. I don't know why these thoughts flooded my mind this last week, but they did. And in one of those classrooms, seven and eight-year-old boys went to Sunday school. And there was a lady that taught our Sunday school class, all little boys, every one of them sinners, every one of them mean as a haint. But there was a patient lady that God put in that classroom. And Sunday after Sunday, she said, God loves you. God will save you if you call upon His name. And Sunday after Sunday, she told us how to be saved. Sunday after Sunday, in spite of how we treated her, in spite of how rude we were in class, Betty Hayes told us Sunday after Sunday, God loves you. How in the name of God could I be such an ingrate this morning? and not lift my heart in praise to God for Betty Hayes. How could you this morning have a godly mom and daddy that raised you up in the ways of Christ, that taught you from day one, God loves you and you can be saved, and you not lift up your heart and voice and praise to God, thanking God that you had a mom and daddy that loved you enough to lead you to faith in Jesus Christ. Think now. Think now. Think right this moment. Who is it you ought to be giving thanks to God for? Somebody that shared the gospel with you. Somebody that helped you in a difficult time. Somebody that showed you the way of the Lord. 
All of us have people in our lives that fellowshiped in the gospel that helped us. Paul said, I'm thankful. How do you pray when you pray for others? You, you pray with a servant's heart. How do you pray when you pray for others? You pray with a thankful spirit. Now I want to move on quickly to the third and final thing, and that is you pray for the spiritual more than the physical. Now, there's not anything wrong in praying for the physical. We pray for sick people to get well all the time. That's why I make hospital visits and shut-in visits, that I might pray with that individual that God would heal their body, bless what's being done on their behalf. Uh, nothing wrong in praying for God to give you a job. Uh, nothing wrong in praying for physical things. But, but notice in Paul's prayer that the focus is not on the physical. Everything he prayed for the Philippians was in the realm of the Spirit. Here's what I'm talking about. Look, look with me, if you will, in verse number 9. Paul said, and this I pray. So in verse 1, he says, I'm a servant. In verse 3, I thank my God. In verse 9, and this I pray, that your love, number 1, may abound yet more and more. Paul said, this is what I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your love would abound. Now, notice that Paul does not identify the object of the love. He doesn't tell us whether he's praying that their love for God would increase or whether he's talking about whether their love for one another would increase. Can I just suggest this to you? If your love for God increases, your love for other believers is going to increase right along with it. You see, that, that relationship is so intertwined, you really cannot make that dichotomy. You cannot separate that. The more you love God, the more you'll love God's people. The more you love God, the more you'll love your family. The more you love God, the more you'll love uh, 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 other human beings. So Paul said, I'm praying that your love might abound yet more and more. Several things are implied. Number one is that love can be commanded. And love is in the Bible. We are commanded to love God. We are commanded to love one another. Secondly, love can increase. I love you today more than yesterday. I love you more today than ever. We understand that love has the ability to grow and love has the ability to deepen and, and love can be stronger than ever before. And Paul said, I'm praying that your love might abound yet more and more, that it might, it might have a stronger flow, that it might, uh, it might uh, go over the banks. But notice that he said that love is guided by two things. Number one, knowledge and judgment. Love's not sloppy. I said love's not sloppy. Love is not mere sentimentality. Love is to be guided by knowledge and discernment. So Paul said, first of all, this is what I'm praying for you. I'm, I'm praying that your love might abound, that it might be superfluous, that, that it might uh, flow with a great force. Do you need to pray that for anybody today? Anybody you're trying to fix? And instead of trying to fix them, maybe you would just pray that God would cause their love to abound yet more and more. And by the way, that fixes about everything, doesn't it? So Paul says, first of all, not only am I thankful to God for you, but I am asking God to increase your capacity for love, that you would love yet more and more. But notice that he, he doesn't stop there. He says in verse 10 that you may approve things that are excellent that you might approve is a is a word from the refinery it was a word for testing gold and they would put fire to the gold and it would draw out all of the dross and all of the impurities so that only the pure gold would remain and Paul said I'm praying that you would have the ability to discern to make good decisions that you might know that which is excellent Uh, in life, the decision is not always between good and bad. That would make life simple, right? I mean, I th I'm, I'm giving you all a lot of credit, but I think most of you all get that right. If, if, if life's decision is only about good and bad, I'm betting you're going to get to good. But what about making the decision between better 
and best. Now, now it gets a little more difficult. Now it's a little bit, a little more difficult to discern. Well, th- this this is good. This is better, but here is the best. How do you know that? See, that's what Paul's praying. Paul is praying that that they would have the ability to know the difference between good, better, and best, and that they would always choose the best, that they would test things, uh, that they would be able to discern what is the best, most perfect will of God for their life. And by the way, what are they going to test it by? They're going to put it under the fire of the Word of God and let the Word of God draw out the impurities. Let the Word of God draw out everything that doesn't belong so that at the end of the day, all you will be able to see is that which is excellent. Isn't that what you want for your life? Isn't that the kind of decisions you want to be making? Not just getting by in life. Not just doing the best you can in life, but making excellent decisions. In order to do that, you have to be able to approve. You have to be able to test. But but then he continues and says in verse number 10, that you may be sincere and without offense. I love this. Thought about just preaching the whole sermon on this word sincere. That you might be sincere. Well, we understand that word today. Sincere. In this context, the connotation of the word is that it is unsullied, it is pure, uh, it is without uh, wax. It is taken from the culture of that day. When they would make a piece of pottery, you know, no pieces were perfect. There might be a piece of pottery that had some spider cracks in it. Well, they didn't just throw it away. They would take some wax and rub over that uh, spider-like crack in the piece of pottery, sand it down, paint it, sell it. Well, you didn't want to buy a piece of pottery that had a spider crack in it that had been covered up with wax, do you? So what you would do is you would take that piece of pottery and hold it up to the sunlight. And the sunlight would reveal everywhere wax had been applied to that piece of pottery. It wasn't genuine. It wasn't true blue. It wasn't sterling silver. Wax covered up the fault. I'm preach just a little bit. What are you using for wax to cover up the cracks in your life? Are there any impurities there? Is there a spider-like crack in your armor? Something you're trying to hide and cover over with wax. You're not the genuine article. There, there's that element of alloy. There's that element of hypocrisy. There's that element that you're, you're, you're not true blue. You're not the genuine article. And it's funny what we use to hide the cracks in our life. Some people try to use church. Well, I got this crack in my life. I better go to church a lot more. And I'm going to tell you, people are not necessarily better off because they go to church more. Going to church doesn't fix anything. You got to do the right thing once you get here. And so sometimes people use the wax of of more church attendance trying to cover up the flaws in their life. And sometimes people try to use morality to cover up the flaws. And sometimes people try to use legalism to cover up the flaws of their life. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to look down on everybody else. I'm going to judge everybody else before they judge me, before they see the flaw that is in my own life. What I'm calling on you to do this morning is to come clean with God, get done with the wax, and be the real genuine article that God's grace saved you to be. Covered with wax. I thought about a couple illustrations, Brother Kelvin, but both of them are sedated. I don't know that anybody would understand it. All of my illustrations are dated. One was when I was in agri class, we took a coffee can, a big one. Back then they weren't plastic kids, so and we took a 16-penny nail and drove a nail in it and stuck a light bulb up under it. Then we put an egg 
on top of that opening in the can. And you know what? You could see everything there was to see about that egg. If there was a crack, if there was a baby chick in there, if it was a double yoked egg, you could see it all because the light exposed every flaw. Back when I was taking typing in high school, yeah, we didn't have keyboarding, we had typing. And if you make a mistake, they had this stuff. Now, I'm not kidding you, this was high tech. It was called whiteout. <laughs> Y'all laughing at me, uh, making me feel inferior. Uh, but but you could you really you could you could rid yourself of all of those mistakes by putting white out on it, and the white out would dry. You go back and type what you meant to type in the first place. The only problem with that is the teacher could hold that piece of paper up to the light, and your goose was cooked at that point <laughs> because the light revealed all of the imperfections. Oh, l l listen to me. Don't try to cover up your imperfections with religion. Don't, don't try to cover up all of the flaws of your life through legalism. Cover your flaws with the blood of Jesus. Amen. So Paul said, I'm, I'm praying that you would be genuine, that you would be without offense till the day of Christ. What an interesting word, and I've got to hurry. What an interesting word, without offense. It means to cause someone else to stumble. It is, it is tripping up someone. And, and we can trip up someone any number of ways. Uh, we can trip somebody up in their walk with Christ by a word that we say to them. We can trip somebody up by an action that we take. It is, that here they are, they're on their, they're following Christ, they're pursuing Christ, they're walking with Christ, and we come up behind them with a word or with an action, and we, we put our foot out and we trip them up. All they were doing was trying to follow Christ, but we trip them up. I, I want to just say to you today, as the sweet people of God, this is something every one of us should fear. Tripping someone who's trying to follow Jesus. I think about those parents who come to church and sing the praises of God and go home and talk to their kids like they're subhuman. They're tripping up their children. I think about those Christians that come to church on Sunday, respond to the invitation, get down in the altar and pray, and then go to work on Monday, and they're dishonest, and they have anger issues. They're tripping up those who are trying to walk with Jesus without offense till the day of Christ. And then his last petition is in the form of a participle. You see it in verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And by the way, that's something all of us ought to be interested in as the children of God, that our lives would be marked by fruits of righteousness. And I know we may protest and say, well, you know how I can't do that. That is the very first thing you have to realize is that you can't produce fruits of righteousness. But notice the prepositional phrase. He says, these fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. You see, here's the key. This is the way it is done. God's not asking you to manufacture or to produce anything. He's simply asking you to let Him do it through you. Notice how his prayer ends. And I want to ask you a question. Unto the glory and the praise of God. Do you think Paul was thinking about how the model prayer ended? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And Paul kind of ends with that same tone, that same note. And he said all of this, love abounding, making good solid decisions about that which is excellent. All of this about being genuine and sincere and all of this about the fruits of righteousness, all of this about not offending anybody in their walk with Christ, all of this is to the praise and glory of God. So when you pray, pray with a servant's heart. When you pray, pray with thanksgiving in your heart. When you pray, focus more on the spiritual 
than you do on the physical. I want us to stand together and bow our heads this morning as we make ready for our hymn of appeal. How has God used the message in your heart this morning? What is the Holy Spirit convicting you about? And how does the Holy Spirit want you to respond this morning? If you've never been saved, and listen, for whatever reason, you've just never done it. You've just never come to Christ. But the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you now, making you aware of your sin and your need of Jesus. Why don't you come to Jesus today, trusting, believing, receiving eternal life. He'll save you. He'll forgive you of your sins. You'll be new in Christ. Why don't you come to Him today? Father in heaven, thank you. For the people in our lives, Lord, who have loved us, who have encouraged us, who have pointed us in the right direction. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.